Brad, what's going on? Uh, nothing and everything, you know, uh, just uh, trying to uh, get through the COVID and uh, the, the whole pandemic, as well as carrying out a lot of research, educating, and uh, hopefully uh, next year we'll be doing some more seminars. Yeah, yeah. I've been following your work for a long time. I remember back in the day following your, you had a column in one of the bodybuilding magazines. I can't remember which one was the muscular development. Muscular development. Yeah. yeah. I remember reading, I used to read that all the time. I was a big, big bodybuilding magazine junkie when I was in, in high school. Then when I was in college, I remember looking at one of your papers. We went over, I think it may be like a biomechanics class. I think it was like squatting kinematics or something. And and then I was like, oh, Brad. And then it's just, it's funny how you, once you get down the rabbit hole of looking at research, I mean, you've put out so much research over the years that you kind of have your hands in like all these different areas in, in fitness. So it's, you, you don't go, don't go far without coming across one of your papers. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, my passion is certainly my passion is to educate and carry out research. So uh, that's nice that that comes across. And Look, I'm, uh, I would say I'm a kid in a candy store because I was a personal trainer for many years. And basically, I'm researching everything that I wanted to know when I was a trainer. It's all these, I really was incomprehensible to me that, you know, you kind of think that research is going to have all these answers. And so many questions when I started delving into the research really were either had very little research or none. It just were poorly answered. So uh, it's, uh, I'm kind of living the dream. Yeah. Well, bodybuilding specific research isn't, it doesn't go back that far, really. That's true. Yeah, um, that's very true. And I, I always somewhat uh, like to joke that uh, bodybuilding really has been the bastard child of the strength and conditioning profession, because most uh, strength and conditioning research, exercise related research is performance related. And uh, the strength coaches, uh, they don't, first of all, they, they kind of look down on, a lot of them look down on bodybuilding as a vain pursuit. And also from a performance standpoint, while muscle development is certainly a, it has a relationship or muscle size has a relationship to strength, uh, it's not a linear relationship. And in generally that's how it was researched. It was researched kind of, I want to say as an afterthought, but just as a, marker to understand uh, mechanistically how it might be driving uh, strength adaptation, strength and, and power adaptation. So yeah, um, really, when I came into the field, uh, going over a decade ago now, as a researcher, um, it just was not a lot, as you were saying, it was a very underdeveloped area of research. Yeah, which is, I, I think why kind of bro science was so popular, because I mean, you, you pretty much only had to go off from people's experience. Like there wasn't a lot of evidence in terms of like literature and research to go off from. So what did you do? You say, well, hey, this is what's worked for these people. So I, it must be semi-accurate. I, I think that's part of it. But I, I mean, I'm sure, as you know, there is also a uh, there, many people if not most people tend to look at someone and make a judgment as to their ability to understand how to carry out training based upon the size of their mm -hmm. biceps and pecs. Uh, so look, when I was an up and coming uh, bodybuilder, who did I turn to? I, I, you know, as a kid, I didn't really know much about research at the time. And I, like you, I was a fan of the magazines. I'd look at uh, muscle and fitness and flex. I'm dating myself now because <laughs> those magazines, certainly flex isn't in, in existence anymore. But anyway, uh, you'd look to what the bodybuilders were saying. And the uh, I would have the uninformed opinion that, hey, someone with uh, 20 inch guns and a 50 inch chest has to know more than the scientists do if there are, you know, even uh, though there wasn't much science, whatever science there was. Um, and I didn't take into account the fact that these guys had great genetics and generally great pharmacology. Yep. Well, I think, I think part of the, the birth of, or really the emergence of the evidence-based fitness community kind of went hand in hand with the emergence of natural bodybuilding, because I think a lot of people kind of, this went the similar path that I did. It was like, Hey, we started out really getting into bodybuilding and getting our information from bodybuilding magazines and things like that. And that worked. I mean, initially you're going to get results from almost anything. So it works. And, and it's not like it's all wrong. Like you'll see decent progress. And then you get to a certain point where, you know, 
you, you kind of plateau and you, your results start to diminish. So then you're like, okay, well, if I'm not going the drug route, what do I do? So that's when it was like, oh, here's this research. This is better information. Why don't we try this? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I to totally agree with the last part of what you said. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I agree that it coincided with the emergence of, na of natural bodybuilding because natural bodybuilding has been around for a long time. I, I competed as a natural bodybuilder, again, dating myself back in the 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, and really, I think over the past decade is when the evidence based really, we've seen this uh, big push towards an evidence based uh, knowledge, you know, relying on it. I personally, I think it more has to do with the internet, uh, with the yeah. emergence of social media and uh, and channels that we can disseminate information better and where you're getting like-minded people who come together. I mean, certainly the uh, social media has done wonders for my ability to uh, disseminate my uh, information, to educate people. If I didn't have social media, uh, not many people would be knowing about my research. I'm yeah. Well, I guess when I, when I said the emergence of natural bodybuilding, I think I really was meaning like online natural bodybuilding because granted, yep. you know, yeah. Natural bodybuilding has been around for a long time, but I mean, even when I got first in the bodybuilding in the early two thousands, like I didn't know natural bodybuilding even existed until guys like Lane Norton and 3DMJ and those guys on the message boards and online started posting about, Oh, here's natural bodybuilding. I'm like, oh, well, this is like an actual sport. Like, oh, you don't have, like, it's not just IFBB and NPC and Mr. Olympia. Like, oh, there's a whole different organization where it's drug tested and, and, and things like that. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, for me, certainly, I think obviously that's an application, but mm -hmm. uh, the pursuit of, of hypertrophy goes way beyond bodybuilding. Oh, of uh, course, so yeah. as, a, as a trainer, um, you know, my I felt the slogan look great naked because most of the clients that I would come into me, they weren't looking to improve their broad jump or, or, you know, take mm -hmm. a second off of their hundred meter sprint time. Their goal was to improve their muscle development. And uh, so I think the broader application for much, if not most of the research, while certainly uh, it has applicability to natural bodybuilding, the fraction of people that actually are competitive natural bodybuilders is very small. Yep. Whereas uh, personal trainers who are training the general public who want to get jacked and, and who want to optimize their body composition, it has a lot more, uh, applic a, lot more a lot broader applicability. Yeah, almost everybody really, whether they'll admit to it or not, would rather have more muscle and less body fat. I mean, you know what I mean? Whether yeah, yeah. they're going to compete in bodybuilding or not, they're kind of bodybuilding and at least improving their body composition is what they're going for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so they get into, to building muscle, kind of get into the, the research a little bit. One of the things that I think you're kind of known for is talking about the primary driver of, of hypertrophy and specifically like mechanical tension. So you want to dive in and kind of just talk about that as an intro? In terms of what? Uh, really just how, like when I mean, we're talking a... about, we're talking about building muscle, like what's it take to build muscle? Like what, what are we looking for with our training to optimize muscle building? So I, I will say this. Um, yes, I have uh, been involved uh, and, and it's certainly an uh, interest of mine to look at what the mechanistic aspects are, but I don't think we should be training necessarily according to mechanisms. I think we should be mm -hmm. training according to the variables. The variables will be a, a product of the mechanisms. But yeah. so I, I kind of wanted to get to this in a roundabout way, but um, we have a very shallow knowledge at this point of mechanisms. Still so mm -hmm. much is um, speculative uh, as much as we'd like to think we're so far along. And, and certainly, by the way, I published a paper, which I guess you're somewhat referencing back in 2010. It was a product of my master's project uh, called The Mechanisms of Muscle Hypertrophy and Their Application yep. Resistance Training. And we've come a long way. My views have somewhat changed over time, certainly in reference to that, based upon just a lot of things that have come into play, but we still have so far to go. And it's one of the things that kind of uh, irks me in the field is that people Many people tend to have, or, or often, I shouldn't even say tend, but often have very hard opinions, very uh, conclusive opinions on topics that like this, that you can't have a, a conclusive opinion about because we don't have enough 
hard evidence to have an, mm -hmm. a conclusive opinion. Anyone who who is very um, opinionated in this fashion and, and has a very strong opinion simply is not um, either either is unaware of the research, don't, don't understand how to uh, value it and to interpret it, or I think even worse, are just looking to make a, a name for themselves which happens uh, unfortunately in the field. So I'll give you some very basics on this because I don't think you want to bore the audience with the uh, specifics of intracellular signaling pathways, but, or maybe you do, <laughs> um, <laughs> which certainly we could get into if you yeah. want, but it, mechanical tension basically is the, uh, it, it's the amount of force that is sensed by a muscle. I'm gonna try to make this more digestible for the mm -hmm. general public. Uh, and it is carried out through a process called mechanotransduction, whereby mechanical forces are transduced into chemical signals within the muscle cells, the muscle fibers, and through a enzymatic process, a series of anabolic and there's also catabolic enzymes, intracellular signaling enzymes, uh, that will regulate the amount of muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein synthesis in conjunction with muscle protein breakdown, which is basically building up versus breaking down a muscle, mm -hmm. is what leads to muscle development over time. So it's the net protein balance, muscle protein balance over longer periods of time that ultimately will de determine whether you are gaining or losing muscle or staying the same. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully that was uh, within the realm of what people can understand and and not too uh, technical. Well, yeah, I figured we would kind of start there and then, you know, trickle down into the variables that are a little bit more digestible when we're talking about volume, intensity, load, frequency, things like that. So the, the next thing I guess would, would we could talk about is just the, the principle of, of overload, because that gets talked about a lot. Everyone's like, OK, building muscle or gaining strength, probably more specifically gaining strength, but progressive overload. Like, how do we when we're looking at building muscle, I guess, specifically build in progressive overload into our training. Yeah, so uh, the first thing I want to say is that progressive overload is often, uh, there is a misperception that it is specific to increasing the amount of weight. It, mm -hmm. That's one of the ways uh, that you can progressively overload, but the word load is in the word. I think that's why people, or at mm -hmm. least one of the reasons why people tend to have that misperception. And I think there's also just a misperception because it's the one that comes most readily when people think of progressively uh, doing, you know, progressively increasing quote unquote intensity, mm -hmm. but progressive overload, there's basically just means challenging the body in a manner that it's not accustomed to. And that can be carried out through multiple ways, adding volume. Uh, you can add volume, you can increase frequency, you can increase load, you can increase the number of repetitions. You can um, re reduce rest intervals. You can, uh, conceivably vary exercises, use more challenging exercises or different arrays of exercises. So there's a, a wide panoply of uh, ways that you can accomplish it. And there are combina different combinations. It's not like you have to choose one or another. You can use some of these or, or multiple ones in conjunction with one another. So uh, it, it when you start looking at the permutations as to how many options you have mm -hmm. for progressive overload, it's it's vast. Well, I think that's what makes programming so interesting because it doesn't and have to be just, hey, you know, lift heavier. There's so many different ways to facilitate progressive overload in the program. I mean, that's that's what yeah. makes it fun. Yeah, correct. And chat, it makes it fun, I guess, for, for you and me, for mm -hmm. other people, it it is somewhat uh, uh, overwhelming to some people, certainly when I have students and you start, you know, because people like to have very simplistic uh, guidelines. They just give them this. And, and by the way, with that said, we're talking now about maximizing muscle growth. Mm -hmm. I do want to, I think it's a very important point that often goes um, underappreciated, is that to get decent results, it, you can, a uh, very basic type of program, very simple, yeah. lower volume, uh, you can train across wide spectrums of loading ranges. Anyway, I've published uh, several articles on this now on time efficient training. So for the general public who's just looking to build some muscle and uh, let's say lose some body fat and in, uh, in the, uh, in the same sense, 
uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, it does take effort, resistance training. You're going to have to push yourself. If you're just doing the, you know, cell phone workout while you're lifting, you're mm -hmm. not going to accomplish much. But assuming you're going to put in some good effort into the uh, into your sets, it's it can be very relatively simple to uh, to accomplish that. Now, on the other hand, to optimize your genetic potential is a much more challenging endeavor. And that's where all of the scientific information starts to become much more valuable for those who want to take their body to its genetic potential. Uh, that's where you need to really use scientific principles. And the, the harder a gainer you are, so obviously genetics are always going to be a wild card in this, but the harder a gainer you are, the more important that's going to be. Yep. Yeah. I, I always say that to clients too. It's like what it takes to deliver results is different than optimize results. Exactly. Yeah. So, so talking about volume, let's dig in there a little bit. So you, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to measure or quantify volume. I think in a, a muscle building standpoint, just using like hard sets tends to, to work pretty well. Yep. What's a, what should we, what should we looking at for hard sets per muscle group per week for someone who wants to optimize muscle building? So th this is always a question that's asked and then bandied about. So people, again, love to get these uh, hard recommendations. I want to make sure that the point comes across is that it's going to vary. Volume in particular is something I've carried out a number of studies on this as well as colleagues of mine. And we just see very large individ inter-individual uh, variations in terms of response where some people mm -hmm. can can get very nice responses with lower volumes and other people with higher volumes. And the other, I think, important thing is that, and this goes for all of the variables in general, is that it's not necessarily a binary decision that you have to have choose a certain number of sets. It well may be now there's no research, unfortunately, to date on this, but that periodizing volume, uh, I've, uh, I'd like to see a study like that carried out. It, it's a challenging study to carry out just because of the time that it would take and the manipulation. But ultimately, would there be a benefit to, let's say, gradually increasing a volume across a, let's say, a given uh, mesocycle and then having a deload or, you know, a active recovery, whatever it is, and then starting that over again? Um, certainly there might. There's a good logical rationale for it because the body can be very um, resi uh, resilient to uh, large stresses for short periods of time, but when a large stress, a high stress is imposed over longer periods of time, the body ultimately breaks down. And that's, I mean, in, in different areas that uh, you can have emotional breakdowns with large stress and, mm -hmm. but with, with training, it's the overtraining uh, syndrome is, so you don't overtrain if you do a large amount of volume for, let's say two consecutive days. Mm -hmm. If you did the same very large volume for two weeks in a row, let's say you're doing 50 sets for you, you know, for 50 sets of squats. I'm throwing out ridiculous numbers, yeah. here. but two weeks in a row, you're going to overtrain. So, and, and different people will overtrain at different rates. So we've kind of uh, come, uh, there's a uh, general guideline that we've developed. I just collaborated on a uh, uh, position stand for the IUSCA on hypertrophy with some great colleagues of mine. Uh, some of the top people in the field. And we came up with a, and this has been bandied about before, but a very general range of somewhere between 10 to 20 sets uh, per muscle. But again, it doesn't have to be the same every week or every month or whatever. It doesn't have to be somewhere. It doesn't have to be the same for every muscle group. I mean, mm -hmm. I so personally, I'm of the belief that uh, you have to look at not necessarily the same thing for each muscle, but the total amount of, of volume that you can do for all the muscle groups combined, uh, and then look to use your volume more wisely for muscle groups that are lagging. So have more volume, generally the reason that, or generally a strategy for improving lagging muscle groups is to increase volume. I'd also say the type of exercise is gonna enter into it. Is it free weights versus machines? Is it single joint versus multi-joint? Uh, you know, uh, large volumes of squats are going to crush you a lot more than large volumes of uh, lateral raise. Yep. 
So, so the, again, it's a topic that's quite nuanced and um, I, I did give a, I'm, I'm giving people what they want or we yep. are when we're, we're giving a kind of general broad guideline, but that should not be considered any be all end all. And there are people that do very well with lower volumes than that. And on, in cases there's, there's people that need more. And, and again, certainly uh, it should be utilized. It shouldn't be thought of as every muscle has to have the same amount of volume it, to me, at least to me, that it should be utilized in a um, muscle group specific context based upon someone's um, weak points and, and strong points. Yeah. So you can almost set it up how, how I kind of like to do it is periods of time throughout the year, you can have almost like specialization cycles where it's like, Hey, right. there's going to be a couple muscle groups or movements or whatever, where we're going to be on that high end, maybe even a little above that end, but that doesn't mean everything's going to stay high. So we bring it high for a couple muscle groups, bring it a little bit down for everything else. Exactly. Uh, the way I like to, uh, to, to give the analogy is consider it like a budget. If you have a certain amount of money to spend over time, if you're going to blow all your money on buying an expensive car, you might not have enough for food. So, uh, you know, if you have, let's say your volume budget for all your muscle groups, apportion it to the more towards the muscles that are, are more unresponsive and you don't need as much for the muscles that do. So you can stay within that budget. Yep. So another thing with, with volume is frequency. And there was a time period where it seemed like a lot of people back in the day were doing like bro splits were really popular once, you know, training every muscle group once a week. And then there was a shift towards more frequency where it's like, Hey, you want to, to optimize things, hit each muscle group two or three times a week. And now it seems like we're kind of at a spot where, Hey, if volume's the same, it might not be too different. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah. So frequency, cert, I, I would say there's still more we need to, uh, to learn about because of some of the designs and the research have not, at least in my, to my satisfaction, provided enough clarification on, uh, to, to make more pointed recommendations. But I would say that in general, frequency is not a, uh, a major, um, it would be, high, again, would be somewhat dependent how it's manipulated, but generally speaking, frequency is not a major a modulator of uh, hypertrophy. It's really a way to apportion. The way I like to talk about using frequency is to apportion volume. And yeah, overall, like bro splits can be very effective. When you start getting into the higher volume bro splits, like when people are doing 20 sets, let's say for uh, the quads, let's say for your legs. They hold like Jay Cutler workouts. Correct. Yeah. 20, <laughs> 20 30 uh, sets for your mm -hmm. legs. It's better to split that up into, uh, generally speaking, over more days. At least that's what the research tends to suggest. Now, it's not a huge difference, uh, but there is some logical basis for it based on the muscle protein synthetic response uh, to a given amount of volume in a given uh, session, as well as just uh, the limited literature we have do seem to show that when you're getting more than, let's say, eight to 10 sets, for a given muscle group uh, in a session, it's probably best to spread that out over uh, another day or two. So as you get higher and higher with your frequent, your uh, volume in a given session. And, and look, here's the other thing I would say is that very long sessions in general just are not conducive to hypertrophy. So if you're gonna, if you're only doing two sessions a week and you're doing two, three hour sessions, it's just not a good strategy to training because by the time you're at your, two hour mark, you know, hour and a half to, you're just not going to have the same amount of uh, mental focus and energy to uh, properly train the muscles that are being done later in the session. So, yeah. Now, when we talk about strength, is that where frequency come becomes a little bit more important? You'd think so, but again, the limited, so I, I still am somewhat skeptical of the, the literature, I, look at this, you know, I'm a researcher and uh, I, uh, I'm a student of, of literature, but we also have to look at uh, when things don't make sense, we still need to question them. And, and you have to look at what the gaps are in the literature. I'll, I'll get to more of that in a minute, but uh, there, there's a logical basis just from a motor learning standpoint that the more frequent uh, practice that you give something, the greater your uh, adaptations from a motor learning standpoint are going to be. It hasn't really been borne out well in the literature. Again, the, uh, we, we did a, a systematic review on this. 
that showed or, or that indicated that uh, volume really that there was a greater effect of frequency, but then when you accounted for volume, it really didn't matter much. Uh, I'm not willing to put all my eggs in that basket at this point. It might be, mm -hmm. uh, but again, just looking at it from a lot when there when the literature to me is not conclusive, when when there are gaps in that literature, and when there is a logical rationale for where it doesn't quite make sense to me, I am skeptical about it, and I'm I. I'm more uh, reserved in my opinions on things like that. Yeah. Well, I think you'd almost run into the same issue. Let's say, for for example, you're a power lifter and you've built up to the point where you can handle quite a lot of bench volume, like, you know, 12 to 15 bench sets per week. You're, you're almost going to need to split that up just because, you know, the difference between set three and set 15, like that couldn't be in one or two sets. I mean, it'd be hard to do that even two sessions. And so no studies have been carried out on the topic in well-trained powerlifters. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, you have to look at the ability of what's called generalization of findings, uh, which means that can you take these findings and necessarily apply it to a given population and, uh, you know, without has actually having powerlifters that are doing this. And in fairness, it's very difficult to get a group of powerlifters and you're going to say to them, all right, I just want you to lift once per week on your main lift, uh, yep. you know, we're going to see most powerlifters don't want to regress. So mm -hmm. they're going to be very hardened into their, uh, into their mindset as to what they want to do. And, and by the way, to your point, so I, I did want to address, I'll take another uh, variable training to failure. Yep. Uh, which That's where I wanted to go next. <laughs> anyway. So good. So we carried out a meta analysis on this topic, basically showed that you don't need to go to failure that, you know, as long as you're somewhat challenging the muscles, probably a couple or so uh, reps in reserve from failure, uh, that there really is not a uh, benefit either on, certainly on strength and really on hypertrophy either. Um, there's a lot of gaps in this literature. I wrote a whole blog post on this because mm -hmm. again, it's, we carried out the meta analysis, but uh, when I'm coaching a, uh, a competitive bodybuilder? Am I just going to say, yes, that's the literature. So that's what we're doing. No, I, I mean, you, you then start to look at your own personal expertise and, and uh, the needs and abilities of the individual. And there's been, again, no studies that have been carried out in very serious bodybuilders or, or just serious lifters. Uh, we just logically, you get to a certain point, you get closer and closer to the so-called genetic ceiling that you have where it gets harder to get results it becomes more and more difficult to challenge the body beyond its present state. And that's a tool uh, that you can use is to go to failure. Uh, there's been no studies that have looked at using selective uh, training to failure. So where basically all the studies have either looked at training to failure for multiple sets or no sets, mm -hmm. it, which is again, a binary decision. You can go, let's say you're doing four sets. You could go first set three RIR, second set two RIR, uh, third set one RIR, and then the last set to failure. Or there's a gazillion combinations. I think the combinations are uh, unlimited, you know, virtually unlimited. Mathematics isn't my strong suit, but uh, you do those permutations. Uh, yep, there's just yep. so many different ways you can, depending upon the volume that you can ultimately carry that out. Uh, so how do you then take that literature into context? And that's why, again, it's so important um, there is a misperception that evidence-based practice is simply deferring to research to give you the answers. And I actually, I collaborated with a, a paper, uh, on a paper with a colleague, Henning walker a good colleague of mine, a great researcher, and uh, it was published about a year ago or a little less in, in the journal Sports Medicine on evidence-based practice and how specifically how to go about uh, utilizing research not to give you the answers but to use as guidelines to guide your decision making process and we went through a whole uh, explanation and discussion of of the travails that are involved when you just try to defer to research it's uh, it's not the way research works in an applied field so uh, you know again i've uh, fortunately i think one of the reasons that my research has become as popular as it is uh, is because number one, I've been a bodybuilder and number two, I was a trainer and I understand the practical applications. And I'm basically, like I said, a kid in the candy store who is 
answering questions that I wanted to know as a bodybuilder and a trainer, and thus it has relevance to what other people uh, want to know. So, I, and with that, I, by the way, I always tell, so I, I'm a professor, uh, college professor. I, I tell all my students that if you want to become a researcher in an applied science like exercise, uh, at least for a period of time, a couple of years, two, three, four plus years, get in, get in the field, be a practitioner, work as a personal trainer, strength coach, whatever disciple, whatever your research focus you want, get it, become a practitioner in that area so you can understand the nuances. And thus, when you then carry out your research, you're going to have an understanding of the gaps and, and how they should be answered. Yeah. Well, I think part of being evidence-based is really, so you look at the evidence from research and then you go evidence-based off from your personal experience, and then Correct. you can kind of use that and then even incorporate some individual difference within the, the population. So with yourself or someone you're working with, like you recognize, Hey, not everyone responds the same. Like research is, is kind of averages. There's always going to be some outliers. Great point. Yeah. So, and, and you kind of hit the nail on the head that a number one research reports, the means, uh, and people are not a, a mean an average. Uh, so, so that'll get you within the ballpark for a lot of people, but there are they're not only your outliers, but there are people somewhere within the borders of those outliers and that mm -hmm. you need to tweak things. Uh, they also, like I said, there's so many gaps in the literature. Research generally studies one uh, condition against another condition. There's so many permutations. It's not binary. So like I said, uh, it's like studying all sets to failure versus no sets to failure. That's one way that you could carry out a training program. It certainly isn't the only way. And it's probably the way that most people do not high level people don't train. Certainly I don't train like that. Yeah. And I, I coach people. Uh, and most people I know don't train that way. Most high level people, at least that I know. So um, it, it behooves people to really have an understanding when they're looking to defer uh, to evidence-based practice, that they are not just taking the research and saying that's the be all end all because there's gaps and there's limitations. So, so re research can provide guidelines general guidelines, and then it's up to the individual to use their own expertise uh, in conjunction with the needs and abilities of the individual that they're working with the trainee, whether it's themselves or whether they're training someone else or coaching someone else to come up with a prescription. And by the way, within that, that's going to be constantly a moving target. So you have to then just because when I've worked with uh, high level athletes, it's not like, okay, this is your program. Here's your program for the rest of your life you got to see how that uh, pans out. You're going to make adjustments based upon injuries, how someone's feeling, how they're progressing, just multiple. There's constant manipulation. There's constant uh, tweaking of the program over time. In some cases, the tweaks are pretty big. In other cases, they're somewhat minor. But you const if you want to continue to progress, you need to continue to monitor and adapt your program to your own adaptations or to the trainees adaptations. Yeah. The program is not going to be static. Like the best program for you is not going to be static. And kind of, I always like to say, it's like, Hey, the best program for you three years ago, probably is not gonna be the best program for you now. Exactly. So the program that's best for you now is probably not going to be the one that's going to be best for you in three years. Excellent. Yep. So let's, let's talk about rep ranges a little bit. This is another thing. I remember back in the day, I'm trying to think what year it was, maybe like 2013 or 14, when you had, you published the one paper where it, com it compared a traditional bodybuilding setup and, and a powerlifting split up set up. And you found essentially that if volume was equated, you could build muscle with multiple different rep ranges, but then there was obviously new, some nuances there with, with time and, and, and stuff. But then over the last few years, there's been more research to, to kind of, expand on what's the muscle building range. Like you can build muscle with lower reps and higher reps, but then from a practical sense, it seems like kind of that middle range is probably still best. Um, so yeah. Better. So, so <laughs> when you say best um, in, in a way, so mm -hmm. I, I want to take a step back to say that, uh, you know, I've changed my opinion mostly through research and, and how it's been the, the uh, emergence of, of new research over time. Uh, so it's always been taught that when I was a aspiring 
fitness professional that you had this kind of hypertrophy range of eight to 12 reps, six to 12 reps. Uh, and uh, that the lower reps, you can build a little muscle, but it's really not great for it, which actually is somewhat true. Um, it, it's not true, like you said. It, so in the lower range, you just need to do more sets to, mm -hmm. uh, the, to equate the volume. But it was certainly always taught that with once you got above like 15 repetitions, 15 RM, 20 RM, that it's basically cardio, that you're, you know, it's muscle endurance and that you're not going to build muscle, that you're not going to um, recruit and stimulate the highest threshold motor units, which are associated with the fast twitch muscle fibers, which have the greatest growth capacity. And um, I, I bought into that, you know, I, I had the authority uh, figure syndrome where people, professors that I had and people that I respected as uh, researchers were preaching this. And uh, then I started to see a little research and I'll never forget this, a colleague of mine, Stu Phillips, who you might know from McMaster University, yep. really terrific researcher. I think it was circa 2013 or 14. Uh, he carried out a study doing leg extensions. So he looked at leg extensions at 90% 1RM versus 30% 1RM on untrained subjects and found uh, no differences in hypertrophy. And uh, never forget this, that uh, he posted the study online and he was championing, ah, oh, we've shown that uh, your load really is not a big factor. And I remember chuckling to myself and I answered him online, like it's a little too brazen. I've been humbled quite a lot. <laughs> and we don't do that. But I was like, come on, Stu. I said, you really believe this? I said, uh, you know, these are untrained subjects just doing leg extensions. I said, they get jacked from doing spin cycling. Their, their legs are going to get jacked. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to carry out this study now in well-trained subjects. You're going to see there's just no way that doing these, you know, pansy light weights are going to uh, uh, build a lot of muscle. So I did, I carried out a study. We had one group doing 30 repetitions, 30 RM. Uh, and, and by the way, we had a total body, like his study was just leg extensions. And I thought that might be a confounding variable that you're not really looking at it. What's called an ecologically valid study that, uh, approximates real world results. So we had a total body training, uh, you know, upper, lower squats, leg press, uh, presses, uh, chest presses, shoulder presses, lat, lat pull downs. Um, and uh, one group did 30 RM, the other group did 10 RM, eight weeks of training. Uh, subjects had a mean training experience of about four years, three to four years, zero difference in their, uh, in their <laughs> yeah. results. And uh, again, it, uh, it was shocking to me. I, I, really, that was a, one of the most shocking results that I had. I just couldn't believe it. And since then, there's been a number of additional studies. So uh, in my long-winded way, I want to say that we've now come to know that over a very wide spectrum of loading ranges, seeing certainly up to around 40 RM, which you start going over 40 RM, good luck to you. I, yeah. mean, I fall asleep <laughs> if I'm doing that many reps. Uh -huh. Uh, so within a very wide spectrum of loading ranges, you can build similar amounts of muscle. It's not clear. There still may be differences in fiber, uh, fiber type specific growth. Um, there's been some studies showing there is uh, potential benefits in that respect. Although we, we recently carried out a study that did not seem to indicate that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, confident enough to rule that in or out yet, but there mm -hmm. could be a benefit to combine. If so, there would be a benefit to combining higher and lower, uh, or at least moderate rep uh, zones. Um, but you can build muscle over a very wide spectrum of loading zones. Now, from a time efficiency standpoint, it probably, like you said, is still that hypertrophy range is probably a, the best bet. Uh, number one, I would say when you train with the very low reps, like your three RM, is the study that was my uh, dissertation study. Uh, they had to do seven sets uh, to get the same results as three sets. In, uh, so we looked at 10 RM versus three RM. And uh, they were, the people doing seven sets of three were toast. They, yeah, they're the beat up. Was, yeah, the joint, joint pain, back pain, uh, two of the subjects ended up with injuries from the study, uh, training induced injuries. So it just was not a, a good model for lung longevity um, for, from a hypertrophy standpoint. Um, so alternatively, if you're doing very high reps, it's not a fun 
people thinking, you know, yeah, lightweight's great. Um, the group that we had doing the 30 RM in the first week, half of them puked. Yeah. Especially during the squats. I believe that, yeah. squats. Uh, there's a lot of acidosis, uh, buildup of metabolic acidosis, and uh, it's just not an easy uh, thing to deal with. It's just not fun for people did not enjoy that workout in that. So bottom line is, and it also takes longer when you're doing three times the number of repetitions, the sets are roughly three times as long. So the moderate rep uh, zone is more time efficient. It tends to be better tolerated, uh, better adherence. I still say there is a uh, at least conceivable benefit from at least having some cycles of uh, higher reps and lower reps. Lower reps are going to help to maximize strength adaptations, higher reps perhaps might uh, help with type one fiber development. At least it's going to help to, uh, or at least conceivably to uh, improve your buffering capacity for your moderate rep ranges so you can actually get more reps. So that's kind of the long and short, but that's again, that's somewhat overthinking of overthinking it for the average individual. Mm -hmm. When you're, when you're the bodybuilder, like, again, if you're a competitive bodybuilder or someone that wants to optimize every last morsel of muscle in their body, then these are the nuances that uh, can make somewhat of a difference. Now, when you're dealing with the super high rep stuff, does it matter how far away from failure you are? Or do you need to push it a little bit closer to failure? It's a good question. Uh, certainly when you say closer to failure, it depends what you mean within an RIR, because when you're 30 or let's say you're doing a 30 uh, RM versus a 10 RM, if you're one RM in uh, one RIR, one repetition away from failure in a 10 RM, it's different than one repetition away from failure in a 30 RM. Yep. Um, but you need, certainly it seems that you can be uh, a little further away from failure with your moderate, lower to moderate uh, rep uh, training uh, zones. Whereas if you're in a higher rep zone now, people, some people say you need to train to failure. That is not we don't have enough research to say that. And I'm skeptical, like the limited research we have seems to suggest as long as you are pushing. Here's the other thing I would say, um, training to failure in a high rep set is difficult to quantify because when the metabolic acidosis causes people to quit before, depending upon what you're actually calling failure, is yep. it volitional failure where you give up or where, so if someone, let's say, points a gun to your head. And then when you're at, uh, you're doing 30 reps and they're okay, you're at 28 reps. You can almost you always do, do it anymore. Way. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if you are doing, let's say a six RM and you're just stuck, chances are you're not, you know, I, shoot mm -hmm. me. I can't, yeah. I can't get another rep. Yep. So uh, again, there there's, and it's very difficult to study that in the literature. Yeah. I remember early on when the like blood flow restriction training had some research when like early, I'm trying, I'm probably talking like 2010, 11, like Jeremy Lenecki was posting stuff. Um, yeah. And I tried it and that always kind of blew my mind too. Cause it was, there were I mean, higher rep stuff. And I guess that kind of, kind of led to, okay, well, if you can build muscle with high rep blood flow restriction, you could probably build muscle with just high rep training. Um, but I do remember like, yeah, there was, it was brutal. You'd get to, you'd get to like 25, 30 reps. And it's like, man, I could probably do another one, but it, I don't know <laughs> if I want to. There are potential different mechanistic factors with blood flow restriction training uh, because it creates a, an ischemia and a very uh, large uh, hyper reperfusion. So we, uh, basically you're going to have, once you've got the cuff off, you're going to have the blood's going to rush back into the uh, mm -hmm. muscle. Uh, so anyway, it, it's not clear. There's more, uh, hypoxia, at least conceivably with the blood flow restriction training. These may be mechanistic, uh, rationales for different hypertrophic responses. So again, these are things as mentioned that we still have so far to go to really have an understanding of what's causing, uh, the differences and uh, either similarities or differences in some of the adaptations that are seen. Now, when we talk about exercise selection, what role does does that play in into programming? Well, it plays a big part if you uh, are looking to be a bodybuilder. Certainly, mm -hmm. uh, muscles have varied attachments, so you, if you're using the same exercise every 
uh, session, uh, you're going to miss out on different heads, different fibers. You're basically you're not going to uh, have complete muscular development, symmetrical muscular development. I'd also say there's a rationale, although it's difficult to research is inconclusive on this, but the novelty of, of exercise, the body responds to novelty. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, the body is going to have less of the an affinity for adaptation. So do, using different exercises at least can promote a novelty effect and, and thus spur greater growth. Now, that doesn't mean that you should be switching exercise, like the whole muscle confusion mm -hmm. thing, like that's just silly. Uh, and, and actually we carried out a study that showed that that could potentially even have negative effects that uh, you start quote unquote confusing your body and yeah, it gets confused in that it's, it doesn't adapt well. Um, Plus it's hard to build in progressions when you're constantly changing well, that, exercises. Yeah, correct. That build not only build in progressions, but that the body is not. Uh, so again, this gets into the weeds with the types of exercises. So my general uh, thought on this is, is that your more complex exercises, multi-joint, particularly free weight movements, squats, presses, rows, uh, should be staples in an exercise. They should be, kept in the routines to a much more frequent extent. And you can vary, let's say machine X. If I do a leg extension, I could do a leg extension today and come back a year from now without doing a leg yep. extension and do a perfect leg extension. Uh, you know, it doesn't cut. So there's not a neural, a, basically there is no coordinative effect to that or very minimal for someone who's a seasoned trainee. Whereas a squat, if I don't do a squat for, if I'm doing a squat today and I don't do it again for, let's say three weeks, I'm not going to be squatting very well. And that, yep. I guess, yep. is to your point about a progression. Not only do you not have a good feel for that, it's also, you're going to tend to regress because your, your neural circuitry is not uh, optimized at that point. So again, I think the, uh, the way that I like to program, and this is more, again, anecdotal, just based on expertise, because we don't have literature to go from on this, is to use the um, auxiliary exercises, if you will, the less complex, more simple, uh, machine-based and uh, single joint type movements, a biceps curl. Similarly, I could do a dumbbell curl today and do it again six months from now and do a perfect dumbbell curl. Yep. Yeah, that's kind of pretty, you know, pretty much how I, I look at it. You know, the big exercises, we keep those in for, you know, pretty much all the time. And then with the accessory movements that, you know, like you said, dumbbell curls, dumbbell curl, leg extensions, leg extension, we can almost use that to kind of spice up the, the programming so people don't get bored. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So I want to talk about cardio too, in terms of fat loss. So of course, we know we've got to get a caloric restriction to, to lose fat. What role does cardio or what role should cardio play in, in fat loss phases to maintain as much muscle as possible? Um, so cardio is a, uh, I'll take a step back, that fat loss is a function of energy uh, balance. If you're going to, in order to lose body fat, you have to put your body in an energy deficit, which means that you are expending more energy calories than you are taking in. Um, that can be done through a combination of more exercise or more physical activity and or less food consumption. Um, certainly cardio is a, uh, you can burn more calories doing cardio than you can generally speaking resistance training, certainly if you're resistance training for hypertrophy. Uh, so it's a, uh, an easier mechanism to, or an easier modality to uh, promote an energy deficit through expenditure. Uh, but you also have to remember that uh, cardio exercise overtraining is a function of doing too much exercise. And that's the sum total of all the exercise you're doing. So if you're doing resistance training, particularly somewhat higher volume resistance training, um, and then you're adding in a lot of cardio and then particularly you're combining it with a uh, caloric deficit, which makes you more prone towards uh, an overtraining syndrome, conceivably, uh, it might not be the best recipe. So I, I do think that cardio, when you're looking to use it for fat loss, needs to be uh, somewhat 
uh, mitigated, uh, but I, I still think it's an effective tool. And again, I think it's specific to the in individual. Uh, so when I've worked with uh, high level bodybuilders for competition, some do quite well without any cardio and others uh, I feel the need uh, they, they need to uh, have more expenditure. Basically, there's a limit to what you want to do in terms of going down in energy uh, intake, in my humble opinion. And thus, at, at some point, it just makes sense to add in cardio. Yeah, kind of along the same lines when we're talking about fat loss phases in terms of volume, does it make sense to lower volume during cutting phases just because you're, I mean, calories play a big role in, in recovery, so lower volume would make sense. But then the other argument would be, well, because calories are lower, you want to try to maintain muscle as best you can. You don't want a lower volume. It's a very interesting question. I'll give, give you kind of a scoop that we have a, uh, collaborated on the paper. It's a meta-analysis that's in review on the topic, just awesome. so the audience knows. A meta-analysis is uh, basically combining, pooling all the studies on a given topic. And the evidence, now the evidence is limited. Certainly I don't have a strong opinion from what we've shown here, but the available evidence suggests that uh, reducing volume is not a uh, good strategy. And if anything, probably keeping volume on the higher end uh, during a uh, fat loss phase seems to be best for uh, keeping muscle. Yeah, we'll keep it maintaining muscle, but then also, you I mean, you're doing more work too. So it's like, you know, I mean, it's a smaller role in caloric expenditure, but it's still probably semi-relevant. Yeah, we looked at it more from the uh, standpoint of, of muscle uh, yeah. maintenance and, and or gain. Yeah, well, yeah, it would make sense though. I mean, if you're you're trying to maintain muscle, you don't want to lower the stimulus that's going to help you maintain muscle. You say it makes, it kind of went against my beliefs. I always well, I mean, for, that again, yeah, that for a long time, people yeah, would that, say that because, because I mean, calories play a big role in recovery. So I mean, it does, I mean, I, it makes sense either way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It would make sense yeah. either way you want to put it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, certainly it's a topic that needs more uh, controlled research, but the evidence that we do have seems to suggest that uh, uh, higher volumes might be the better way to go. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to mention your new book that the, you did a revision of the Max Muscle Plan. Yeah, really proud of that book. Uh, so it's um, basically I have a textbook called The Science and Development of Muscle Hypertrophy, which really gets into the nitty gritty of the science uh, as the name implies, but it's a textbook that's for people who are generally you want to have some background in exercise physiology and exercise science uh, and, and really want to learn about the uh, science of it. Uh, Max Muscle Plan, while I do go through the science, it more is a consumer oriented book that gives a general template for training. And I talk really about how to customize programs uh, to maximize development. I want to give a shout out the uh, Forward was written by the late, great John Meadows, who is a uh, really dear friend of mine. And um, sadly, he passed in August and I dedicated the book to him. So it has uh, the book has an extra special uh, uh, motivation for me at this point to to promote. Yeah, John was an awesome guy. I was lucky enough to have him on the podcast once a few years ago. Yeah. Super guy and a tragic loss to the industry to, to have lost him. Where can people find the book? Uh, it's available on Amazon, also through my publisher, Human Kinetics. Uh, but uh, Amazon is generally the easiest. Cool. I'll put the link in the show notes. And where can people get more information about you and, and what you're doing? Uh, just Google me. I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm all over this. So I'm, I'm most active on Instagram and uh, Twitter. I do more science-based, science-y stuff, but, well, like hard science on Twitter and more uh, consumer-friendly science stuff on Instagram, but my, I'm an educate researcher educator. So all my stuff is still sciencey mm -hmm. and yeah, you just search me out and you'll find me and I have a, a blog too. So just Google and, uh, and you'll find all the info you want. That's, that's the most badass answer. When someone asks that, just, just Google me. <laughs>